It's a great advance for civilization. Civilization 6, that is. I'm Scott Ott with Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, and this episode of Right Angles brought to you by the members at BillWhittle.com. And gentlemen, perhaps you know what I'm talking about, but this week there was a nine-minute video clip posted on X, I believe, of uh, one of the people who works at Neuralink, another Elon Musk company, uh, interviewing a man who is paralyzed basically from the shoulders down. Um and he has a Neuralink implant, this new product that they're trying to develop, this brain-computer interface that was allowing him to play chess on a computer. And during the interview, if you watch this clip, he's talking to the guy. He's having a conversation with the guy from Neuralink. And his name, I want to get his name here. It's, uh, let's see, the patient's name is Noland Arbaugh. And he's, Nolan is having this conversation about how cool it is to be able to play chess as he's playing chess. So he's, play, he's playing chess with somebody, and you see chess pieces moving around, and he describes the ability to move the chess pieces around as using the force, he said. He just imagines where he wants the piece to go, and it goes there. And so, cool. oh, it's amazing. And he's able to, you know, carry on this. He's listening to this guy who's sitting next to him, occasionally talking to him and moving chess pieces around on the board in the computer that you can see there, which they're not really even drawing attention to. He just is kind of casually playing chess, um, which he obviously can't do if he can't move his, his arms at all. However, he said they've also hooked him up with, um, with the video game or video experience, whatever you want to call this, uh, Civ Six, the uh, Civilization Six, and he said he stayed up until like six in the morning playing this game and was able to actively engage in it. He said he used to play this. They they have this uh, tool that allows him to move things on a computer with his mouth. So there's this oh, yeah. little like straw that he holds in his mouth and he can move things around. And he said, but really, Stephen Hawking, he said it was such um, it's such a big game. It's such a big experience, basically, that it was really hard and exhausting for him to to play it that way. However, now he plays it with his mind. His mind has a has a little uh, contact in it, a brain computer interface. But that was exciting. And and I watched that Stephen Green and I thought, man, is this fantastic. This guy can get to do something that he couldn't do. And therefore, pretty much, I mean, if you can do that, you can do anything on a computer um, that you want to do. Uh, but then I read another story, I believe this one in the Wall Street Journal, about another company called Precision Neuroscience. Precision Neuroscience is actually, uh, I think, being run by a guy who was originally one of the founders at Neuralink, but had a difference of opinion with how things should be approached and you know which kind of method they should follow. And so he went off on his own, and he's a surgeon. And um, they are doing... Uh, an interesting kind of testing because apparently the way they test things, Steve, is you don't have to get FDA approval for this. Like Neuralink was, you know, working to get FDA approval. Basically, Precision Neuroscience has already done six implants, and the key is they do them temporarily as they test and develop things. So a guy named um, Jeffrey, what's Jeffrey's last name? Jeffrey Kiefer, 71-year-old man who's got uh, Parkinson's disease. He goes in there. He gives permission to Precision uh, Neuroscience and says, yeah, while you're boring a hole in my brain to see if you can fix my Parkinson's symptoms, I authorize you to also test this brain-computer interface of yours. And the objective there is to get him to be able to control a computer with his brain, and they were training it in this instance where they would have him do things with his hands, and then they would track what the computer was seeing. You know, basically they were translating hand mm -hmm. movements into computer uh, interpretation of that. So far, uh, Precision Neuroscience has done since ele April 11th of last year, um, they, or I'm sorry, April of last year, they've done 11 temporary implants. Um, Steve, this is. This is an exciting new realm because of the hundreds of thousands of people who suffer a, a break, basically, in the connection between their brain and the rest of their body. This, even if you could just operate a word processor, Steve, it could absolutely transform the lives of these people. And there's so much more to it than that, which I'll, I'll get to in a sec. First, I just want to say, you know why this guy played Civilization Six until three in the morning or whatever it was? Because he could. 
Um, That's right. I've been playing. Piker. I've been playing Civ. I think since Civ Two came out, I want to say ninety four or ninety five, and it might be the best example ever of just one more turn, then I'll go to bed. Just, 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 yeah. just, just yeah. one more. T- and of course, that becomes just one more turn. I just, I, Siri, I just got to do this one thing. As soon as I get this one thing done, I'll go to bed. And Seriously, Steve, his biggest problem or challenge in using this new uh, system is that he's got to watch out for pressure sores because he's, yeah. he gets locked in playing this game. So they got they got to make sure yeah. that they move him and stuff like that. Yeah. And j- just to give you an idea of, of how much I know what I'm talking about with Civ here, um, I, I like to play this game on maps so big. And I've got, I've got a pretty fast computer that by the time you start getting to the, the last hundred years of your game, the time between turns is so long. You get up and you have, make a cup of coffee. You go to the bathroom. You read a little bit in your book. And oh, 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 all the other sieves are done. It's my turn to play again. Um, so I just <laughs> I love the game and the fact that somebody who, who who just didn't have the ability to play anymore got to do it. That's exciting. And and for all the other hundreds of thousands of people who have basically had their bodies robbed from them, whether through accident or, or, or disease or, or whatever the cause, to be able to get some of that back, to be able to do, you know, we take, we take that for granted, just the ability to do whatever it is, to just get up and get that cup of coffee. Um, that, that must seem like a miracle for somebody who's been in, trapped in a chair or a bed for however long it's been. Um, but there are wider implications to this, and I think that's maybe just as exciting. And that is, you think about how much human potential is limited, not just by by crippling diseases or, or, or spinal cord injuries or things like that, but just by the frailties of our, of our human bodies. Um, mm. I am much more excited about the prospect of being able to I- integrate this sort of thing into the driving experience where your reaction times could be sped up to the speed of your brain and not slowed down by the speed of your brain to your arm to the action and and all of that um, i think that is a, a m- much better probably much safer than than fully automated driving where a, a an ai or an algorithm is supposed to do all this stuff for you and then not suddenly decide to do something weird you know the the driving equivalent of a of a black viking like we saw with google gemini a couple of weeks ago uh, so this idea of untapping human potential not just from those whose whose bodies are have, have been have been hurt but for all of us who are just limited by these human forms i haven't even really begun to think about what those potentials are but um i'm i'm very excited scott Bill Whittle, I'm sure you've gone down this this path uh, before, mentally at least, in in imagining what could happen here. But the, one of the first things I thought of while watching this interaction with Nolan Arbaugh as he was playing chess on this thing was, my goodness, if you can think something and a computer can understand what you want to do, well, why not slip into an exoskeleton and have the uh, have you know, think that you want to stand up and that you want to take a walk. Yeah. Um, because the, if the if you could tell the computer what to do and the computer can tell a robotic no, limbs what to do. That's the next step. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What do you think? Well, my first thought on this was, if I had a chance to talk to Elon about this one, I'd say, Elon, buddy. Uh, buddy. Is this neural, this neural link thing, is it, a, is it a tube or is it a valve? Now, if he's as smart as he thinks he is, then he would say, well, that's the best question I've ever heard about, asked about that. Here's what, here's what I mean. This connection allows the wetware to control the software that runs the hardware, yeah. right? If it's a tube, that means it would also allow hardware to control software to control the wetware. And I don't want that. I uh, want a valve. Yes. I, want, I want a one-way system where... I am able to control software, but the software is not able to influence the wetware. And something tells me that this is not a valve. Uh, something tells me that if you create this pathway, then you have connected two things that are that are physically separated in the real world. Now, I don't have a problem with the tech. I have a problem with the people who who 
not even the people who develop the tech, it's the people who inherit the tech. Those are the ones who are the real bastards in this in this equation. I remember when Facebook used to be a place where you would just go and, and find pictures of your Aunt Marty and see how she's doing before they were telling you what you could see and couldn't see and what stories would be suppressed and so on. I remember where YouTube used to be a place where you just upload videos for people to see if they hit the subscribe button and nobody was in there tinkering around telling you what you need to see and not see so that they could socially engineer your opinion. This is a tremendously powerful tool and and I'm in favor of the technology, but I'm concerned about the potential for misuse only because I've seen so many other wonderful technologies be misused by power-hungry weenies who genuinely think they have a, a, a God-given right to tell other people what to do. And, and if this machine allows you to tell software what to do, I'd like some reassurance that's telling that would tell me that that, that no, there's not a, a possibility of the software that's telling me what to do. Because if the ability to move a chess piece is something that subtle, if, if it's such a subtle thing that you can have a full conversation at the same time, some remote part of your brain is deciding to move a, 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 a bishop from one square to another, then if that is in fact the tube and not a valve, then it's entirely possible that the software is rewriting you. And that's something I think we should be at least talking about. Yeah. Well, it's fascinating. Of course, with every technology comes the potential for uh, abuse. I mean, after all, I love cars. I even like my car. It's just all the other people driving cars I don't like. Um, you know, those people seem irresponsible to me, and they don't know what to how to use that thing correctly. Um, and then while Bill was talking, it also occurred to me that there have been a lot of situations where things have been developed explicitly to do harm that later turned out to do great good. Missiles, for example. <laughs> You know, missiles were designed to kill people. Um, however, now it opens up the, the frontiers of space. And so we have, there's always that dichotomy. And frankly, it's just, a, it's like a hardware mirror of human nature um, that I think we're uh, kind of going to have with us forever. However, a as I watch this, I couldn't help but first of all think, think Great. I hope this guy gets to really exploit this technology for his own benefit and to be able to, you know, to even can you imagine if he could live at home with some a couple of servant robot dogs? <laughs> I mean, just just being able to say, you know, hey, Fido, can you can you bring me another uh, protein drink or whatever it is? Um, you know, those, those kind of opportunities to be able to communicate, to be able to manipulate things in physical space, to be able to engage in play. I mean, that to me is like, it seems so insignificant, but man, can you imagine being paralyzed from the shoulders down and how hard that's got to be all the time and how great it must feel to just lose yourself in a game, to just play and have fun and challenge your mind and beat somebody, you know, and, you know, feel all of those emotions and experiences. Um, that, that, and I also love the fact and the guy at Precision Neuroscience said this, there's room in this space, so to speak, uh, for lots of competitors, just like there are in any other industry. And everybody, you know, different people will come up with different approaches. And here's this guy who basically said, hey, I don't, I don't agree with the way uh, Elon's doing it, so I'm going to do it my way. And so he goes off and starts a company, you know, that does it a different way. And there'll be different people who see different potential in this and allowing those uh, those flowers to bloom, so to speak, allowing those experiments to go forward and letting people decide, you know, how far they want to go and what they want to do. Um, this, I, I know I've said this before, I just think this is the most exciting time in the history of the world to be alive and to be able to see magnificent things like this that are happening and to be able to dream of the potential of more. And, you know, if you're, if you're like uh, us, you're probably thinking, okay, well, what can I learn from this and how can I apply it in some way? Like, is there, is there some area in my life where I'm assuming limitations that are not necessarily real and that could be conquered in some way, but I've just decided, you know, because so many of us, I think, have settled into the sort of uh, metaphysical wheelchair, 
and said, well, I guess I could just sit here. In fact, Jeffrey Kiefer, the 71-year-old Parkinson's patient who is allowing them to experiment on his brain, basically, he said when he found out he had Parkinson's, he thought, well, I could just sit around in my house and be depressed and watch TV, or I could get involved and do something. So not only has he um, you know, used his body in the interest of science, <clears throat> but he is also, at one point, was the chairman of Michael J. Fox's uh, foundation mm-hmm. uh, fighting Parkinson's disease, and he's donated a lot of money to that cause. And so... You know, these people to me are an inspiration to say, push the envelope, do something different, make a difference, try something, give it a shot. Don't just sit there in your rhetorical wheelchair and hope that somehow life will get better for you. For Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks to the members at BillWhittle.com for making Right Angle possible.